Okay, for lesson four here in our last unit in 930, uh, we're going to talk about a bunch of different characteristics of our quadratic functions and our graphs. So how to look at a graph and find those things and then how to look at an equation and find the same things. So we've just talked about how to look at equations and tell what happened to the graph, how it's been transformed, if you will, right? Our translations, reflections, um, all that good stuff, stretches, compressions. So now we're to just like look at the graphs and find these key things that will help us uh, later on when we go straight from equation to graph uh, in new ways. So we're going to talk about a bunch of different things. We're going to talk about the vertex, the maximum and minimum value, the zeros, the axis of symmetry, and the y-intercept. All right. So we're going to start with the minimum value and a maximum value. So every parabola can have one or the other. It can either have a minimum or it can have an, a maximum, right? So um, the minimum value would be the y-coordinate of the vertex if the parabola is opening up. So you can kind of see a picture of that below. When the parabola opens up, that vertex is the lowest point on the graph, right? So it doesn't go below that point at all. So it would definitely be a minimum, right? And when I'm looking at that, the minimum value the minimum value, that's like, what is the lowest point that it can be? Well, we're talking about the y, right? We're talking about the y value that it would be, right? That's up and down. That's your highest and lowest. So the minimum value would be at y equals zero, or sometimes we just say the minimum value is zero, right? Either one, however you want to think about that. Uh, so it is the y-coordinate of the vertex if a parabola opens up. Now, a parabola will have a maximum value if it opens down. So if it's been flipped upside down like the second one, then you can see that, that vertex up there is the highest that it's possibly going to be. So that would be the maximum that it would be. So it would, this one would have a maximum value at y equals 5. Or you could just say the maximum value is 5 either way um, on that one as well. So it's the y-coordinate of the vertex. If it's um, opening down, it'll be the maximum. If it's opening up, it will be the minimum. All right. Now, the only thing is it's really pretty easy to figure that out when you're looking at the graph, right? When you're looking at the graph, it's easy to tell if it's a maximum or minimum, and it's easy to tell where it is. And remember, you're just looking for the y-coordinate, right? Now, if I only give you the equation, it gets a little bit trickier. So if you look at number one, I actually included the equation with the graph. It's the same equation for that graph, but just so that you can kind of see how where we could look when we're looking at our equation to see um, what it's going to be like, right? So if I note, if you remember back to your to your transformations from the last couple of days, if my parabola is opening up, that means that there was not a reflection, right? Or that means that it was mul it was not multiplied by a negative. Not multiplied by a negative. So that means that it's opening, opens up, right? So if all I had to go on was my equation, I would know if it was opening up or down by looking for that reflection, right? Now, if you look in the second one, on the second one here, it was multiplied by a negative, right? So that was a reflection that happened to our graph, so which which in turn means that it will be opening down. And that's how I can tell if I'm gonna have a maximum or a minimum, right? So I'm looking for that reflection. If all I have is the equation, and I can't, you know, so I can't look at the graph to see what the value is, remember also your transformations to see where that vertex has moved, right? So remember, inside the parentheses, that's moving left or right. So that's not going to affect my maximum or minimum. I don't care if how far it goes left or right. What I'm looking for is how much it has moved up or down, right? 
So this one, there's no plus or minus at the end. So it hasn't moved up or down. So this would be like plus zero, right? So that would be my minimum value would be at zero because it hasn't moved up or down. If you look over here at the right, this one, right, again, I don't care if it moved left or right, that doesn't matter to me. So inside the parentheses doesn't affect it here on this one. But on this one, I see it said plus five at the end. So that means that the vertex moved up five. And so that up five, that's gonna be my maximum value, that positive five. So that's where you're looking for your equation, right? If you don't have the graph, then you look for the reflection to see if it's opening up or down. That'll help tell you if you have a maximum or a minimum. And then after that, then you look at that number that's being added or subtracted at the end to tell you where that vertex has moved up or down, and that would be your maximum or minimum value. All right, so here's just some practice problems for you. This would be a good time for you to just pause your video, see if you can do it on your own, right? Decide if it's a maximum or minimum for each, and then uh, decide, figure out what that value is. Notice there are four problems here. These two equations do not match those two graphs. They're four separate problems. So practice two from the graph should be quick and easy. Practice two from the equation, and make sure you can do that as well. Hit pause, and then start it up again when you're ready. So I look on my number three here, I can tell, definitely tell my parabola is opening down. So this one would be a maximum, which I just realized I probably should be putting in green, right? <laughs> okay, so this is my maximum value. And the value is right here at y equals five, or just five, either one. But we need a maximum of five. All right, my second graph, I see it's down here at the bottom, which means I have a minimum this time. And my minimum, oh boy, let's see, what are we at? Negative two, three, four, five. And my minimum would be at y equals negative five or just negative five on this one as well, okay? So hopefully from the graph, that was quick and easy for you. I agree that the equations are a little bit more difficult, so let's walk through that. So first thing I'm looking for on number five, five is, is it opening up or down? So I see here I'm multiplying by two. It's a positive number, so that means there's no reflection, which tells me my graph opens up. If my graph opens up, that means that I have a minimum, right? Then I look at the end. Remember, inside the parentheses moves me left or right. That I don't care about for maximum or minimum. I care about how much it's moving up or down. So this is moving vertex moved down six. So my minimum would be at y equals negative six or just negative six, one or the other, okay? So I have a minimum value of negative six for number five. Okay, now let's look at number six. So again, trying to figure out if it's opening up or down. Uh -huh, and this one I see it's multiplied by a negative number. So this one has a reflection. So that means that it is opening down. When my parabola opens down, that means that I have a maximum. Okay. And again, now I'm trying to figure out what is the maximum value, right? I don't care how much it's moving left or right or stretching or compressing or anything like that. All I care about is where it's moving up or down. So this one tells me my vertex is moving up five. So my maximum would be at y equals five or just five. Oh, I got a lot of fives in these problems. That was a coincidence. So uh, just remember where you're looking in the equation. All right. Uh, the next thing that we're going to find from our graphs and equations are called the zeros. Now, zeros are really important. These are things that we will use all the time, um, and it's really essential that you know what they are. So the zeros are the point or points where the parabola crosses the x-axis, right? The x-axis, that's the big key 
I should probably just highlight this one instead of using the red marker. That's what I'm looking for, right? I'm looking for where it crosses the x-axis. Now, these points could also be called roots. So zeros are also called roots, right? And if you think back to our last unit, we talked about that as well, right? We talked about finding the zeros of an equation. We talked about finding the roots. That's all from unit two. You know how to do that with equations, even though it's been a little while, right? If you think back to that, um, we called those zeros or we called them roots when they were the solutions when we set the equation equal to zero, right? Or when y equals zero, that's where it's crossing the x-axis is when y equals zero, right? Okay, so those are the points we're looking for. Now, sometimes we just write the zeros as numbers, right? So we could say in this one that the zeros are two and four, right? But really, those zeros are points. So I could write that as the point two comma zero and the point four comma zero, right? The y value is always zero, so we could write them as points, two zero and four zero. I prefer when we write them as points because that really will uh, kind of solidify in your head what those things are. But you know, a lot of times we're just looking at the numbers on the graph and so I could see if you just wrote two and four as your answers there. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is practice finding those zeros. First, we're gonna practice finding zeros from a graph. So just looking at the graphs, there's not really any work to show here. Just being able to pick out where are those point or points where the parabola crosses the X axis. Go ahead and pause your videos and see if you can try and then start it up again when you're ready. All right, so again, X axis on these, I'm gonna highlight my x-axis so we can see it a little bit better on here. So I'm just looking for the points where it crosses. So I can see here on this first one, I'd have negative one and I would have two. Or I could have the point negative one, zero and the point two, zero, right? Either way you wanna write it. Okay, in the number eight in the middle here, there's only one point this time where it's touching the x-axis and that point is one, all right? Or I could write that as the point one comma zero, right? If you think back to the last unit when we were solving our quadratic equations, there were times when we only got one answer, right? It was when I was factoring and I got a bin squared or both of those factors were exactly the same. That's when I get only one answer. This is what the graph looks like for, uh, for quadratic equations that have that as their answer. So now you can kind of put a picture to what you were finding in the last unit. If I look at the third one, number nine here, wait a second, that parabola isn't crossing the x-axis at all. There are no zeros, right? So you could say no zeros. You could say no real roots is oftentimes a lot uh, of what they say. That's definitely a possibility, meaning there are no zeros or roots on our graph in the real world. You'll get next year into what happens if we're not in the real world. But for now, that's all we have to say, right? Or you could say no solutions, right? That's what we called it uh, back in the last unit. We said that there was no solution. Uh, if you think to what those equations look like, well, that's when I had a square root of a negative number, right? So I did get some no solution problems. Think of those quadratic formulas where you ended up with a no solution. This is what the graph looks like for those problems. So you can see our three different possibilities. Man, this is just bringing me back to that discriminant day, right? Where we could have two solutions. That's when the parabola crosses in two places. Looks like number seven. You could have one solution. That's where the parabola only crosses in one place. That's looking like number eight. Or you could have no solution. That's when it doesn't touch the x-axis at all, which absolutely could happen if it opens up and it's above the x-axis already. It's not gonna have any zeros, right? So you could write it any one of those three ways and that would make sense. All right, speaking of 
equations, you are going to have to be able to find the zeros from just the equation. So we're going to practice that here. This is going to look really similar to the things you did in the last unit. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Remember that finding the zeros really means set the equation or I should say set y equal to zero, right? That's where it crosses the x-axis is when y equals zero. See if you can solve these, pause your videos, and then restart it when you're ready to go. So if I set my y equal to zero on this first one on number 10, I would get zero equals x squared minus 49. All right, now there's more than one way to solve this. If you're thinking factoring, you could say, ooh, that's dots. But to me, when I have an x squared and no x term, this tells me I'm going to solve by square root. So I'm going to add 49 to both sides. I'll get 49 equals x squared. And then I'm going to square root both sides since I have the x squared by itself. x squared and square root cancel out. I'll get x oops, equals, now don't forget, the square root of 49 is 7, but it's also negative 7, right? Plus or minus. When you write that square root sign, your next step has plus or minus on it. Don't forget. Or write it like I did with the 7 comma negative 7. Because 7 times 7 is 49, but negative 7 times negative 7 is 49 as well. So this is telling me that my parabola is crossing the x-axis at the point 7 and at the point negative 7. So hopefully you're picturing in your head what that parabola would look like, right? I'm not sure. Well, let's see. It's looking like it's probably opening up since it's not multiplied by a negative. So it's probably it's something like this where I'm at, well, a little bit more symmetrical, I guess. Negative 7 and 7, right? So you could write this as the point seven zero and the point negative seven zero. Either way. All right. So number 11, same idea. I'm going to set it equal to zero, turn y into a zero. That's when I have my zeros, my x-intercepts there is when y equals zero. Now, on this one, I hope that you didn't do any bin squares or foiling or anything like that because remember again, all I have to do is get whatever squared by itself and take a square root. So I have negative 16 equals x minus 3 in parentheses squared. Now my whatever is squared is all alone, so I can take the square root here, square root and squared, cancel out, oh no. But I can't take the square root of a negative number. That's not going to work. So this is a no solution. So once you have the square root of a negative, remember you have no solution. Again, remember that's okay. What that would look like on my graph, it looks like I'm opening up because I don't have a reflection on this one either. So that just means that I have my parabola looking something like this, right? Where my vertex is above the x-axis already and it's opening up. So it's okay to get a no solution for your zeros. All right, the next thing that we're gonna find is our y-intercept. Now, hopefully you remember what a y-intercept is way back from unit two. That's one that usually sticks with us. Uh, the y-intercept is the point where the parabola crosses the y axis, right? Same idea. So if I'm looking at my parabola here, it can only cross the y axis in one place. No matter how I shift or move that parabola, it can only touch the y axis in one place. Sometimes it's not shown on the graph, right? It would be a really big number, a really small number, and the, the graph is good, you know, like I don't have it on the graph, but it's always there. So you can always find your y intercept. In this case, the y-intercept would be at negative 2. Or really, it's a point, right? It's a point where the x-coordinate is 0. I like to put that on here as well. It's when x equals 0. So if I was going to write that as a point here, I would be 0, comma, 
negative two. Do you see kind of why I like to write these as points? It kind of clears up which ones are um, your zeros or your roots, right? That's when you have numbers in the X's and the Y is zero. And it clears that up between that and this Y intercept where the number is in the Y and the X is zero, okay? So just remember that the Y intercept is when X equals zero and the zeros are when y equals zero, okay? Okay, so since you've done a lot of y-intercepts in the past, I only have one graph and one equation for you to practice doing. So pause your videos and see if you can do it. So again, I'm looking to find the y-intercept, place where it crosses the y-axis. Hopefully number seven was pretty easy for you. The y-intercept here would be four, or you could write that as the point zero comma four, right? The four would be in the Y spot. Okay, now on the second one, here I just have the equation. So remember that the Y intercept is when X equals zero, right? So I'm gonna plug in zero in for X. There we go. So it's gonna say Y equals zero minus four squared plus one, right? And then I'm just gonna solve away. So zero minus four, that would be negative four squared plus one. Now use my order of operations here. Negative four squared, be careful, is positive 16. And 16 plus one is 17. So my y-intercept is 17, or I could write that as the point 0, comma, 17, right? I plugged in 0 for x, and that's why x equals 0 in my point. So you can do it either from the graph or from the equation. All right, last thing, the last really interesting key thing from our graph um, is what's called the axis of symmetry, right? The axis of symmetry, that's the line, the line where it splits that parabola in two perfectly symmetrical halves, right? So if I look at my graph here, I would say, well, here is that line. If I fold this parabola along this line, that would give me um, two halves that would land right on top of each other. If I took that piece of paper and folded along that line, right? So notice that this line is a vertical line. It's always going to be a vertical line that goes through the vertex, right? And splits it exactly in half. So if you remember, so if I ask you to find the axis of symmetry, you really need to give me an equation of a vertical line, right? This is always going to be um, x equals a number. That's the equation of a vertical line. And if you, if you see, it says if it has to go through the vertex, then that means that that number has to be the x-coordinate of the vertex. So it's going to be a vertical line that goes through the vertex, so my equation will always be x equals, and that number would be the x-coordinate of the vertex. So if I'm looking at my graph, that's a lot easier to figure out, right? I can just look at the graph and say, okay, if this line has to go right smack dab through that vertex right here, right? Well, that's at x equals three. This is my equation of my line, x equals three. This one, you always have to write it as x equals a number because it's a line and that's, it's a vertical line and that's what the equation looks like for a vertical line. When you get to an equation, it looks a little bit different, right? So let's practice that now. Um, hopefully, it'll only take you one equation to figure it out, but the graphs will be a little bit easier, so take a shot at a few graphs here for you. So if I look at the graphs, I'm looking for that vertical line through the vertex. So this would be x equals negative 3 would be my axis of symmetry. 
All right, in my second one here, okay, I don't have my vertex labeled with a point, but it looks like it would be right there. This is where, this line would be where it splits it in half. So my axis of symmetry would be x equals one this time. Here on my number 14, ooh, this is interesting. It's actually lining right smack dab up with the y-axis. That happens a lot, right? If we don't have any translations left or right, my axis of symmetry, technically I could write that as x equals zero. That is what the vertical line is actually called, but you could also call this the y-axis. The y-axis is our axis of symmetry. So that could happen. Just be ready for that. The x-axis can never be an axis of symmetry because that's going sideways. It'll never split our parabola in half. All right, so hopefully the graph ones were easy. Here's the equation. So remember, I want the vertical line that goes through the vertex. So this time I'm looking for where did it move left or right? I'm not really so concerned with where it's moving up or down, right? But I could find that as well. So I see in my equation inside my parentheses here, it says plus two. Remember back from a couple lessons ago, if I'm adding inside the parentheses, I'm actually moving left two, right? If I'm subtracting inside the parentheses, I'm actually moving right. That one is kind of counterintuitive to what you would think. And then here I see that I'm moving up three. So if I needed to, I could find the vertex here. My vertex would be the point. Let's see, left two would mean it would be at negative two. Up three would mean that it would be at positive three. So my vertex would be at negative two comma three. Now that I know my vertex, now I could say my axis of symmetry is the vertical line x equals through the x coordinate of that vertex. So x equals negative two is my axis of symmetry. All right, so just using those transformations that we've done over and over and over the last few lessons will help you find all of these different characteristics as well. So remember, maximum and minimum depends if you're uh, opening up or opening down, so you're looking for the reflection, right? That's what's gonna tell you if you have a maximum or a minimum. The zeros are the points where it crosses the x-axis, so you're, calling, uh, you're setting your equation equal to zero or y equal to zero in order to solve for those. Your y-intercept is where it crosses the y-axis, so that's when you set x equal to zero. And then your axis of symmetry, find that vertex, and then remember that it's also the equation of the vertical line, so it's x equals a number, and it has to be the x-coordinate of your vertex.